could focus accountability efforts and the various programs pioneered by the DT Institute in support of Yemen's economic and political capacity building efforts. Uh, our moderator for this session will be Olga Ruda, who currently serves as DT Institute's project director for a number of rule of law programs, including in Yemen. Uh, as the project director, uh, uh, Olga provides technical leadership over all aspects of the program and liaises between DT Institute's international and local partners and other key stakeholders. Uh, she joined DT Institute after over 15 years with the American Bar Association's Rule of Law Initiative, uh, where she managed and implemented human rights and justice research and capacity building projects in the Middle East and North Africa and other regions globally. Uh, at ABA ROLI, she served as the program director for the Justice Sector Training, Research and Coordination Plus program and as lead subject matter expert for the International Justice Sector Education and Training Program, uh, both funded by the Department of State's Bureau of uh, International Narcotics and Law Enforcement. Uh, Ms. Ruda has also uh, provided remote support to US government sponsored programs in complex conflict affected environments, including in Syria and Libya. Uh, in addition, Ms. Ruda led the implementation over two, uh, of over two dozen justice sector assessments worldwide and designed programs to strengthen the capacity of justice actors to improve their response to trafficking in persons and violence against children. Among other subjects, Ms. Ruda is a graduate of American University's Washington College of Law's LLM program in international law and legal studies and of the Kyiv National Taras Shevchenko University's law faculty in Ukraine. So Olga, please. Thank you very much for, uh, for this introduction. Uh, so uh, I would like to begin with uh, giving you a little bit of an overview about DT Institute uh, as, uh, as an organization and some of our work in Yemen, uh, introduce uh, my colleagues and uh, kick off with a series of questions for them. Uh, so DT Institute is a, a nonprofit organization uh, which operates in the international development space in the areas of promoting stabilization, transition and peace building and uh, supporting the development of independent media, technology and human rights uh, programming. Uh, as an implementer uh, of uh, international development programs, uh, we partner with various uh, institutional donors to empower uh, local uh, leaders and communities uh, uh, to act as agents of change uh, at the local, at the national, and at the international levels on issues of greatest concern to them. Um, our commitment uh, to uh, investing in local capacity is also seen in our function as a funder, uh, where uh, DT Institute supports uh, small local organizations across the world uh, through our philanthropic work. Uh, this funding enables uh, our partners to innovate, uh, to test out promising new ideas uh, and approaches to various developmental challenges, and uh, which could then be scaled up for um, larger programs and ownership uh, by our local partners. Uh, through our uh, DT Institute's ongoing work in Yemen since uh, 2020 on the Yemen Human Rights Forensics Lab and uh, its expanded uh, version, the Yemen Human Rights Forensics Lab Plus programs, uh, DT Institute has been uh, working to preserve and analyze evidence of human rights violations in Yemen. Uh, in, lar uh, in large part, this work is being done uh, in partnership with uh, the organization called Mnemonic and their Yemeni archive project uh, that focuses on the collection and preservation of open source uh, digital evidence from online, from various online pl platforms. Um, and we have been also working to, uh, to present uh, findings from the analysis of this evidence and from other uh, on the ground documentation efforts uh, in uh, thematically focused analytical reports, uh, which have so far focused on topics such as uh, freedom of expression, uh, violations against uh, personal liberty and integrity, uh, children's rights, 
and uh, attacks against critical civilian infrastructure. In addition uh, to this analytical effort and documentation effort, uh, DT Institute has also partnered with uh, 10 Yemeni civil society organizations, uh, which we have brought together as part of the Justice for Yemen Pact Coalition, uh, where our partners are able to spearhead a locally led advocacy efforts and campaigns that are informed by findings from their own and DT Institute's uh, broader um, human rights documentation work. Uh, and these campaigns are aimed at encouraging the uh, international community to take a unified stance on genuinely committing to bring the full range of transitional justice mechanisms uh, into the ongoing peace negotiations and making them an essential part of uh, any peace, peace agreements for Yemen. Um, I'm very pleased uh, that today uh, we have with us uh, uh, Tofik Al Hamidi, who is the president of one of Justice for Yemen Pact uh, members, Sam Organization for Light, Rights and Liberties. Uh, he, so he can reflect on his perspectives uh, from, he, from the civil society led efforts on justice and accountability in Yemen. Uh, Mr. Al Hamidi is also joined uh, by my colleague Dan Volkovsky. Uh, who is a researcher with DT Institute and who has been instrumental in leading the development of the uh, thematic analytical re reports on human rights violations in Yemen, um, as well as uh, Sofian uh, Benashur, uh, who serves as the chief of party uh, for USAID Regional Violence Prevention Program for uh, the Middle East and North Africa, uh, which covers Yemen uh, with Search for Common Ground. Uh, I'm not going to go into full details of uh, my, uh, my, my colleagues' uh, biographies. I'm sure you can, you can find, uh, find all of those details in line as I would like to, um, for our panel to begin touching on some of the more important questions. Uh, and as we heard from the very insightful first panel, uh, there, is, there is a need there are for a comprehensive post-conflict uh, plan uh, for, uh, for Yemen that needs to focus on some of the key issues uh, in a holistic manner. Uh, we have also uh, heard uh, very clearly from, uh, from, from Ambassador Lander King uh, about the US and the international community's commitment of including pathways to justice uh, and accountability in any parts of peace processes in order for those processes to be sustainable. Uh, and I think the big question uh, for uh, uh, that, that this, uh, this panel hopefully will try to answer is how. How can we make sure that uh, justice and accountability issues are mainstreamed uh, in any uh, uh, ongoing peace process and, and dialogues uh, in Yemen? Uh, so uh, the first question that I'm going to ask uh, uh, my colleagues is uh, focused on uh, the evidence of uh, human rights violations uh, and uh, any the, the incidents of human rights violations that have been occurring in Yemen uh, over the past uh, 12 to 18 months. Uh, from uh, your experience that uh, you have been working to document, investigate different types of human rights violations in Yemen, including in the in this more recent period uh, following uh, following the truce uh, and the uh, the solution of the group of eminent uh, eminent experts, uh, are you seeing any uh, changes in the trends and patterns? patterns uh, of violations uh, that have been happening in Yemen. It could relate to uh, typology, geography, alleged perpetrators, uh, victims. Uh, um, so like how, is, is, is the truth really truly contributing to, uh, uh, to, to meaningful, uh, to some kind of meaningful change that, that the Yemenis are feeling on the ground? Um, okay, I can, I can take this question to start. Um, and I think that it's, you know, a one, one topic that I think should be brought up that has, we have seen a change in since the truce went into effect relates to civilian casualties from landmines. Now, as the ambassador brought up in, in the last talk, since the truce went into effect, there was a nationwide decrease in violence, which is welcomed and much needed in Yemen. Um, but at the same time, the UN reported that in the subsequent three or four months after the truce went into effect, there was a 20% increase in civilians who were killed and injured by landmines mines and unexploded ordnance, and particularly children. Um, children were particularly hard hit. They, according to Save the Children, something like three quarters of wartime casualties among children after the truce were caused by landmines in UXL. Um, and in general, you know, the, the likely culprit behind that was increased mobility after the truce went into effect. Um, a lot of uh, people went, you know, IDPs, for example, internally displaced people went to visit their homes. Um, people went to visit family or, or traveled for medical treatment um, or for leisure. And in all those cases, that increased mobility seems to have led to an increase in, in, in civilians killed and injured 
captured by landmines. Um, I think that it's, it's worth mentioning that the Houthis in particular have been um, implicated in, in widespread landmine usage in Yemen. Um, obviously, Saudi Arabia also admitted to using cluster munitions in Yemen at one point during the conflict, but you know, the Houthis have been um, the the group of eminent experts before their mandate was dissolved said that there was you know because they used a reasonable grounds um uh criteria in their reports and they said there was reasonable grounds to believe the houthis had violated international humanitarian law with the widespread use of landmines throughout the conflict and this includes anti-personnel landmines which are banned categorically um because yemen has ratified the the mine ban treaty of 1997 it also includes anti-vehicle landmines um, which are not on the surface of it illegal but the way that they're used are is illegal in, in the sense of being planted in civilian areas before withdrawing. Um, and I want to draw a particular attention to the issue of children. I mean, children in Yemen across the world, but especially in Yemen, are at heightened risk of landmines in UXO, you know, because kids are uh, kids are curious and they're not very risk averse. And, um, and in addition to that, landmines have been planted. All parties to the conflict, all parties to the conflict have repurposed school buildings for military use. And in many cases, those buildings have been mined before the parties withdraw, which means, you know, we've seen over the past year or so, the one of our partners, the Russet Coalition has documented a series of incidents in which kids have been injured and killed in school buildings because of unexploded ordnance buried in classrooms and, and such. Um, so, you know, that is one um, definite human rights issue that has changed since the truce went into effect. Um, there's another issue that I would like to bring up as well that that's sort of a wider temporal scope and you know it relates to the conflict on the whole but also stretching into the current period since the truce um, and that relates to personal liberty violations as Olga mentioned you know you've got overlapping categories of arbitrary detention or people being detained without a legal justification and enforced disappearance in which people are taken from their workplaces or off the streets and um, in some cases never heard from again and their families aren't informed of their whereabouts and torture and ill treatment. Now, all parties to the Yemen conflict without exception have been documented as, uh, as perpetrating repeated and grave personal liberty violations since the conflict started, all of them. You know, that includes the Houthis, it includes the internationally recognized government, it includes the Islah Party and the STC, the Southern Transitional Council. Among the coalition, the UAE and Saudi Arabia have also been implicated in this. Um, and, you know, it, it, the, it, as a sort of flip side of the coin, not only have the perpetrators been universally um, um, represented, but the victims have also been universally represented. If you look at Yemeni society, all segments of society have been impacted by these violations. Um, all types of people and men, women, children, elderly people have all been disappeared or, you know, and subject to a routine of, of, of torture in prisons. Um, one of the changes that's gone on recently that's interesting to note, and this is from interviews that we conducted with researchers who, who work with SAM, Mr. Tafik's organization, who work on personal liberties issues for a living, and also with researchers at the Abductees Mothers Association. And many of these researchers, in addition to working on these issues, have family members who have been taken over the course of the conflict. It seems like across the board, there's been a decrease in the severity of these violations since the conflict started into the current period. Um, and it's really, it's, it's a sort of a confusing finding and the reasons for it, I think are, are somewhat unclear and they depend on each area in question, you know, but very briefly, I'll go into Aden, for example, you know, Aden in, in 2017, there was a series of media reports. Uh, Sam, Mr. Tafik's organization wrote about this. Also the Associated Press and Human Rights Watch sort of blew the lid on a network of detention facilities in Aden that were being run by the UAE backed forces there um, in which, um, you know, in which Yemenis were routinely, honestly, the, 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 title, sort of the top line point about these facilities was that sexual torture was being administered in a widespread and systematic level against people being held there. And since that series of reports, um, you know, Yemen's general prosecutor moved to try to assert control over some of these informal lockups. Um, and also there were a series of advocacy campaigns locally, including by the Abductees Mothers Association, protesting against these overlapping violation types in Aden. You know, so it seems like in Aden specifically, the decrease, and, and by severity, what I mean by a decrease in severity, I mean the number of people who are being taken, the amount of time that people are, are held in detention for, the amount of 
of time they're disappeared for before their families are informed of their whereabouts and the actual treatment that they're exposed to in detention and the torture they're exposed to in detention all appear to have gotten less severe as time has gone on. So in Aden, it seems like that was a almost a direct reflection of the, um, the media coverage that came about and then the general prosecutor's efforts plus the efforts of local civil society organizations. Um, but it really, it, it depends. I mean, why has this happened in Sana'a as well? Why are researchers from AMA and Sam from Sana'a telling us that the severity of these violations has decreased over time? I don't know. And it's, it's very confusing and it depends on each you know, particular um, location. But I would say that that's another point that, that has changed since the truce went into effect and more broadly over the course of the conflict has been and, and this is by no means to say these violations are still ongoing. They're still ongoing on a regular basis. People are still being taken from their homes by all conflict parties. And generally, and I, I want to emphasize this point, the common thread that connects these cases is that people are taken on the basis of perceived opposition to whoever is doing the detaining. And that can be anyone. I mean, it can be, for example, someone who is traveling. We saw a case file recently of someone who had been traveling to Sana'a from, from Madrid for, for medical treatment, and he was disappeared, you know, because that was deemed suspicious. And People who have traveled to Ma'arab from Sana'a to renew their passports have been disappeared, you know, or, or detained arbitrarily. So it really impacts all segments of Yemeni society. All perpetrators are represented, including some very powerful Yemeni figures. Politicians have also been disappeared since the conflict started. Um, but it appears that over time, the severity of those violations is, is going down. So I'll stop there and, and leave it to the next Great. panel. Thank you. Uh, Tufik, uh, would you like to add something uh, from, from the experience, uh, like Sam's, uh, Sam's human rights documentation experience? I will speak Arabic. Saeed, I will be with you in the month of Ramadan Mubarak. In the fact, what we talk about is the people or the people that are written in the legal institutions or even the United States of the United States, is what we can say is the head of the Jebel Al-Galid to what happens in the inside of Yemen. The matter of 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 the ومستوى بؤر التوتر والمواجهة بين هذه الأطراف لكن باختصار كل ما أنتجته الأمم المتحدة من اتفاقيات من مواثيق من معاهدات سقطت في اليمن وهم ضحايا هم اليمنيين بالدرجة الأساسية ابتداء من المواليد الذين خرجوا إلى الحياة وانتهاء بكبار السن الذين ربما لا يجدون يعني حبة الدواء من أجل أن يذهبوا إلى إلاك الأطراف اليمنية كلها تشترك بعضها في انتهاكات معينة وبعض الانتهاكات تصبح خاصة بطرف من الأطراف على سبيل المثال في قضايا تجنيد تجنيد الأطفال تقريبا كل الأطراف لكن تأكد أن نسبة جماعة الحوثي تصل إلى ما يقارب 90% إذا بحثنا عن الضربات الجوية ستجد أن التحالف العربي هو الطرف الأساسي والفاعل في ضربات الطيران باستثناء الضربات المدفعية لدى جماعة الحوثي الحصار هناك الحصار الكلي والحصار الجزئي بمعنى أنا أريد أن أقول أن اليمن دمرت فيه كل مظاهر الحياة كل مظاهر الحياة واستهدف كل ال الذين يعيشون على هذه الأرض النساء تم اعتقالهم وعذبنا ومتنا تحت التعذيب من خلال الرصد تقريبا كل يمني دخل إلى سجن من السجون تعرض إلى التعذيب اليوم لدينا رصد بما يقارب 700 ضحية ماتوا تحت التعذيب في سجون مختلفة إلى أمس وأنا هنا في واشنطن وأنا أتلقى بلاغات عن مداهمة بيوت عن اختطافات عن إطلاق رصاص مثلا في مدينة عدن على سبيل المثال ذلك أمس بلاغ من الحديدة عن اختطاف شاب وإخفاءه في سجون طارق صالح عضو مجلس الرئاسي في الساحل الغربي ذلك بلاغات عن إخفاء العشرات في محافظات إب التابعة لدى جماعة الحوثي في انتهاكات استمرت الهدنة بغض النظر صحيح أن هناك نسبة ضائلة لكنها مستمرة وبصورة مخيفة ومقلقة هذه الحرب دخلت إلى كل زاوية من زوايا البيوت اليمنية دخلتها بالجوع بالخوف بالاعتقال بفقدان الأمال والشعور النفسي اليوم الحديث حتى عن المستقبل لم يعد الحديث مجدي إذا تحدثنا عن إعادة بنية تحتية اليوم هناك 
انقسام اجتماعي مخيف داخل اليمن انتقل الصراع من صراع سياسي على السلطة اليوم إلى صراع باسم الدين والهوية والتاريخ والجغرافيا وهذا بحاجة إلى آمات طويلة باعتقادي أن من المهم أن يشترك فيه اليمنيون بدرجة أساسية مع المجتمع الدولي لمحاولة ردمه اليوم من يتابع وسائل التواصل الاجتماعي يصاب بالذهول يصاب بالدهشة إلى أي مستوى وصل اليمنيون في العلاقات فيما بينهم البين على المستوى النفسي اليوم اليوم من سيجبر ذلك الشخص الذي فجرت بيته ألف ومئة بيت تم تفجيرها بالدناميت من سيجيب عن أسئلة الأطفال لماذا فجرت بيتنا من سيجيب عن أسئلة البنت التي كانت في مدرسة ثم أصبحت في مخيم لا تجد حتى حمام تذهب إليه أو مدرسة تذهب لكي تتلقى هذه التعليم الجوارب النفسية اليوم التي تعاني منها الأمهات أنا على سبيل المثال في فترة 2017-18 كنت أتلقى تسجيلات لدرجة أن أنا لم أكن أنا من كثرة البكاء ومن كثرة الألم الذي أسمعه من الأمهات ومن الزوجات ومن الأطفال الصغار في عام 2018 أدخلنا بعض التلفونات الصغيرة إلى بعض السجون لكي نسمع ما يدور داخل هذا السجن أنا تقريبا لم نسمعها ربما إلا في الحكاية في الرواية البوليسية أن يحدث هذا في اليمن أن يعرى شخص 18 يوم تحت الشمس ثم تطلق ثم يطرح عليه طعام من أجل أن يأخذ إذا أراد أن يأخذه تطلق عليه الكلاب لكي تأخذ هذا الطعام ثم تنهش من جسده هذا حدث في اليمن ولدينا توثيقات بهذا الآن ونعرفهم بالاسم نعرف أسماء الضحايا ونعرف أسماء المنتهكين ونعرف حتى أسماء الكلاب التي كانت تمارس هذه الانتهاكات لأنها كانت كلاب عسكرية بدرجة أساسية لا شيء في اليمن يمكن أن يتخيله اليوم اليمنيون وصلوا إلى مرحلة نريد أن نعيش كما يعيش سكان العالم لم يعد الطفل اليمني مثل أي طفل في العالم ماذا يجب أن تدركوا جيدا ولم تعد المرأة مثل أي مرأة في العالم تمارس دورها في البيت ولديها زوج في المعتقل ولديها أولاد بحاجة إلى أن توفر لهم لقمة العيش رواتبها توقفت السوق الاقتصادية لم تعد مجدية لدينا سوق عمل مخيف في الاستغلال والابتزاز هذا وضع المرأة على سبيل المثال إذا أردت أن تبحث عن كافة المستويات لماذا اليوم ما زالت الحرب مستمرة لماذا؟ لأن الشاب اليمني فقد كل أحلامه فلم يعد له حلم إلا أن يقاتل مع الطرف الأول أو الطرف الثاني مقابل القليل من المال حتى ولو مات قدم اليمنيون خمسة ألف مقاتل قتلوا على الحدود السعودية يدافعون عن السعودية من أجل أن يأخذوا بالمال السعودي لعله يعود فيبني بيتا أو يتزوج ثلاثين ألف مقاتل مسجل في هذه المناطق لدينا أصدرنا تقرير بعنوان محرقة الحدود ولدينا تقرير آخر بعنوان يمنيون في السجون السعودية ولدينا تقرير آخر اسمه الغيبة الطويلة يتحدث عن المخفين قصرا في سجون جماعة الحوثي ولدينا تقرير ثالث بعد يعني كل نحن نحن اصدرنا 45 تقريرا نوعيا عن كل الانتهاكات تواصلنا مع احدى النساء نسالها ماذا جرى لها في السجن قالت لقد اخذوا منا كل شيء لم يعد لنا شيء ماذا بقي لنا اصدرنا تقرير بعنوان ماذا بقي لنا يتحدث عما تعرضت له المراه اليمنيه داخل السجن الحديث عن اليمن حديث الدموع حديث الالم كل ما تعني هذه الكلمة اليوم من كان صادقا مع اليمن فليس فلي فليضع يده بيدنا لوقف هذه الحرب ربما سنتحدث عن العدالة الانتقالية عن رؤيتنا في سؤال آخر لكن هذا وضع الذي أقدمه هو جزء بسيط حقيقة جزء بسيط مما تعيشه اليمن اليوم في رمضان على سبيل المثال وجبة واحدة تأكل الأسرة وجبة واحدة والبعض ربما يخرج يبحث عن الطعام في 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 القمامه. صحيح ان اليوم الازمه اليمنيه تحولت ازمه جوع. لكن يجب ان ندرك جيدا ان الازمه اليمنيه ازمه سياسيه مرتبطه بكرامه هذا الشعب. اذا تناسينا هذا الامر سوف نعيد انتاج نفس الاسباب التي ستعيد دوره العنف لليمن بعد فتره من الزمن. شكرا. شكرا. 
you know it might be hard hard to follow such such a, an emotional account but yeah. uh I don't have any further comments, I think, uh, on that question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay. All right. So. so I think, okay. So I think we can then perhaps move to the, to the next question. And, uh, you know, some, some of the, some of the things that, uh, Tafik was, uh, you, you were talking about, like the, the, the countless victims, uh, that, that are not, not being, whose voices are not being heard in, in any of the, in, in any of the peace process, in any of the negotiations processes. Uh, can you talk uh, about, uh, are there any concrete ways that the local civil society organizations in Yemen, uh, how can they navigate the disconnect between, uh, uh, you know, like the, the presence of, uh, of victims' voices and survivors' voices, uh, uh, the, um, the, the presence of the voices of representatives to marginalized groups uh, in the peace process? How, uh, what can the civil society in Yemen do to, uh, to begin to integrate those, uh, those voices into the ongoing dialogues to make sure that uh, whatever, whatever peace agreement uh, eventually comes out from those dialogues uh, is truly inclusive of the needs and the visions of, uh, of the most vulnerable people in Yemen? بداية أن أحيي المجتمع المدني اليمني الحقوقي من على هذا المنبر وأعتذر شديد الاعتذار للنشطاء الذين اليوم معتقلين في السجون بعضهم يتبعون منظمة سام منذ خمس سنوات وهم معتقلون في السجون جماعة الحوثي حتى هذه اللحظة لكن المجتمع المدني والحقوقي بدرجة أساسية في اليمن ساهم بصورة كبيرة إلى أن تخرج كل هذه الانتهاكات إلى السطح يعني شكلوا عملية حلقة واصل بين الضحايا وبين المجتمع المدني لجان التحقيق الدولية لجان التحقيق الأممية ساهم المجتمع المدني بصورة كبيرة جدا في كشف كثير من الانتهاكات وبين للعالم كثير مما يحدث داخل اليمن الشراكات التي جاءت فيما بعد مع منظمات المجتمع المدني عززت العمل وجعلته أكثر نوعية مع الحرب انطلقت منظمات المجتمع المدني الجميع كان حريص على كشف الضحايا بدون ربما خطة واضحة ودقيقة في هذا الجانب لكن مع بعض بالشراكة مثلا مع ديتي أو مع غيرها من المنظمات ساهمت هذه الشراكات في توجيه منظمات المجتمع المدني بحيث أصبحت أكثر فاعلية وأكثر دقة وأكثر حضورا العمل الحقوقي خلال ثمان سنوات خلق وعي حقوقي لا يمكن أن يستهان به من حيث إدانة الانتهاكات الكشف عن الانتهاكات الإسراع بتقديم البلاغات أول بأول خلق رأي عام يمني وإلكتروني ضاغط حول قضية من القضايا إلى غير ذلك برغم أن المجتمع السياسي حاول أن يقسم المجتمع المدني حاول أن يجذب مجموعة من المنظمات مجموعة من النشطاء هنا وهناك مع اختلاف ومع هذا الجذب الجميع متفقون على المساءلة يعني ستجد ربما الطرف الأول يقول أنا مع المساءلة ليسائل الطرف الثاني والطرف الثاني يطالب بالمساءلة لكن في النهاية متفقون على وجوب المساءلة اليوم ما الذي يجب أنا أدعو المجتمع الدولي بصورة صادقة وحقيقي ألا يتجاهل المجتمع المدني والضحايا في أي عملية سلام يمنية قادمة من أجل تعزيز المساءلة الجنائية اليوم إحنا بحاجة المجتمع خاصة الضحايا بحاجة إلى التنظيم بمعنى يجب أن تتشكل تكتلات خاصة بضحايا التعذيب تكتلات خاصة بالبيوت المفجرة تكتلات خاصة بالأموال المنهوبة يعني تصوروا اليوم ما يقارب 2000 شركة نهبت في صنعاء بحجة الأحكام بحجة أحكام قضائية لدى جماعة الحوثي نحن أصدرنا تقرير تقريرين وتقرير الأخير كان بالشراكة مع ديتين ستيون حول المحاكمة الجنائية رصدنا ما يقارب 500 حكم بالإعدام لخصوم سياسيين صدرت من محاكم موجودة في صنعاء عندما تحدث عن صنعاء صنعاء تشمل محاكمة أبناء الحديدة وأبناء صعداء بالإضافة إلى محاكمة صنعاء هذه بحاجة إلى أن المجتمع المدني يعيد ترتيب نفسه بحاجة إلى التنظيم ثم هذا التنظيم الجزئي يتحول إلى تنظيم كلي بحيث نصبح ورقة وصوت باغط بضرورة استبعاد القائمة الواضحة من منتكبي جرائم حقوق الإنسان في الشمال وفي الجنوب وفي الشرق وفي الغرب في أطراف أصبحت واضحة أنها يجب أن لا تكون في المستقبل حاضرة سياسية 
إذا حضرت هذه الأطراف السياسية في المستقبل فأنا باعتقادي أنه سيكون إشارة سلبية جدا على أن المستقبل اليمني لن يكون كما نريد وبالتالي أنا دائما أقول أن إشكالية اليمن تمثلت في أمرين من 62 73 في نقطتين أساسيتين الأولى تركز السلطة والمال في العاصمة عدن وتعز والنقطة الثانية أنه مع كل دورة عنف في اليمن في الشمال أو في الجنوب لم تحدث مساءلة كان المجتمع يلتف حول الحاكم الذي يمتلك القوة وانتقلوا إلى مرحلة مقبلة لتأتي دورة عنف جديدة اليوم يجب هذا الأمر أن يتوقف يجب أن نساعد المجتمع المدني في اقتسام السلطة واقتسام الثروة وفي مساءلة مرتكبي جرائم الجرائم على هذا الشعب اليمني ويجب ان يدرك هؤلاء الذين اساءوا بحق اليمني واساءوا على المستوى الاخلاقي وعلى المستوى القانوني ان المجتمع المحلي والمجتمع الدولي لن يتركهم بدون عقاب. Thank you. Uh... Uh, Sufyan, I know that your, your program works also a lot with uh, the representatives of marginalized communities in Yemen. So perhaps you can talk about uh, um, like any success, success stories, examples of, uh, of, of successes or challenges that you have faced in uh, making sure that their voices are integrated into the, these processes. Yeah. So, I mean, I think what, what I'll say when it comes to marginalized groups, and there are many, I think it's very important to understand when we talk about marginalized groups, um, you know, under the program we work with at Search for Common Ground under the USA uh, Advancing Tolerance Program, it is strictly focusing on the Muhammadin, which is a darker skinned ethnic group, and uh, IDPs or Northern people who have been displaced to the South, who have faced, in terms of violence, the highest levels of risk. Um, and the challenge that we've seen working with these groups is that it's actually very difficult to just mobilize. Uh, these communities to understand their needs, prioritize their needs, and develop responses to their needs. And that's a precursor to even thinking about getting into the peace negotiations and uh, the peace process. You know, when you look at the hierarchy of needs here, yes, that's very important, but what comes before that is understanding, you know, what, what, what the needs of those communities are first. Um, and if we look back to the last uh, peace process in Yemen, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think there was maybe one representative of the Muhammadan uh, communities uh, present in those negotiations, um, let alone uh, any other marginalized group. So what we've seen through, through our program is that there are opportunities for mobilizing uh, through community leaders of those groups, uh, identifying key risks, identifying priorities and developing uh, initiatives. Um, and that kind of mobilization can be very useful during the peace process negotiations because then they have a better understanding of what the community needs. And when we're talking about peace negotiations, it's all about representation. You know, what, who is being represented at that table? Who's being represented at, in those discussions? So if we have representatives who are aware of the needs of those communities, able to voice their concerns, then it's, uh, you'll see much more representation of those groups in the process. Um, that's what I can add for now. Then anything from, from your end in terms of uh, perhaps some of the successes or challenges uh, that, uh, that we have been seeing with uh, uh, integrating, the, elevating the victims' voices? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think one, one point I just want to mention that's sort of tangentially related is the fact that you know it's a one positive development has been the sort of centrality of, of prisoner swaps to the talks to you know wind down the war and it's important to note that you know prisoner swaps often include people who are have nothing to do with the conflict or were involved in a civilian role um, and you know to the extent that the international community I mean the personal liberty violations I talked about before you know um, often people who are have been taken off the street or arrested and detained and tortured for a, you know for a total uh, absurd reason, like they've got a last name affiliated with one of the conflict parties, but no connection, you know, those people are later included in prisoner swap deals. So I would say to the extent that the international community can continue to prioritize prisoner swaps. And to the extent that already, you know, it's something like an additional 14,000 Yemenis have been included in lists that have been exchanged between the two, the warring sides. But, you know, the, 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 the centrality of prisoner swaps to the peace process 
in its current stage, I think has been a very positive development. And it doesn't, unfortunately, it doesn't sort of lead to necessarily greater accountability in the long run. But in terms of getting people home to their families and ending the suffering of people in detention and enforced disappearance, it is a very positive development. So I, I did just want to mention that. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that actually gives a very good segue uh, into discussing the whole accountability and transitional justice issue uh, and uh, the notion of how, how that should be central to, uh, to a peace, like, or a central component to a peace process. Uh, and yet, uh, in our con uh, consultations with, uh, with Sam, with our other local partners, what we have been seeing is that there is a uh, you know, like pretty pretty visible frustration, I would say, uh, among the local civil society community uh, uh, that uh, the perpetrators uh, who should actually be held accountable for violations are instead getting a seat at the negotiations table, getting a seat at the uh, as part of the reconciliation uh, process and the reconciliation committees, uh, and uh, because of that, uh, there's there's also some like I guess like a sense uh, or a feeling that. Uh, uh, the uh, kind of like the entire notion of transitional justice is being subsumed by just one of its component by by the need for reconciliation, uh, which probably sends a wrong message to uh, the perpetrators regarding potential impunity. Uh, so perhaps uh, I I would like to to, to find out uh, from 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 your experiences. Do you think there are any uh, meaningful ways in which the international community could help shift this shift the messaging uh, to help make sure that the transitional justice gets back uh, solidly into that into the dialogue processes uh, that the full range of justice and accountability measures are reflected and is it still possible to do this now or uh, it's it, hope, hopefully it's not too late to do this in this stage. Great. So I, I can start with that one. I mean. Um, it's a very complex question. Uh, and, you know, I just to touch on something that Taufik said, when we're talking about Yemen, I mean, I, I've been there, uh, you know, a few times, I mean, it's my focus and my work, and there are so many issues and challenges that come up. And it's, it's very difficult to focus on one or the other, but this is actually quite an important one. Um, and it's a bit of a double-edged sword. So, if we are strictly speaking about the prospects of a potential peace process, on the one hand, um, in the run-up to the peace process and the negotiations, if we put documentation, accountability for all human rights violations as a kind of uh, stage one condition for the peace process, then there is a potential likelihood that some or most of the actors may not be amenable to that and maybe just withdraw or they back off uh, out, of the, out of the process. On the other hand, if we enter into a peace process um, in which human rights violations are not being dealt with, either through transitional justice or through existing legal frameworks, um, then there's a strong chance, as all research and historical uh, precedent will show, that the conflict will repeat itself, or uh, at least parts of it might reemerge. And that's why the work of you know, the DT and SAM and all these um, institutions who are you know, working on these issues is extremely important because it plays a crucial uh, part in, in, in the process. Um, and then there's the question of the emphasis, putting the emphasis only on reconciliation component and not on the other parts of transitional justice. Um, and that also leaves us with several risks. So by not putting the emphasis on all of the aspects of transitional justice, then it stands to leave a gap where accountability is concerned. Um, and Olga, as you stated in your question, you know, it stands to perpetrate this perception or reality that uh, of impunity. Um, and it also you know, leaves unresolved grievances for victims and it risks to cause elements of the conflict to, to reemerge. So, so where does that leave us here? Um, I think the question or, or the answer cannot be uh, an either or framework. It's difficult to have a stage one condition of the inclusion and the mandate of uh, transitional justice accountability mechanisms at the cost of actors staying engaged in the process. But at the same time, a peace process without the inclusion of, of transitional justice accountability um, poses significant risks. So, so that leaves us with the question of, you know, how can transitional justice be included in a meaningful way while not dissuading the key actors uh, from taking part. 
and uh, how to engage that question. So I think it's safe to say that probably no one has the full answer to this question. I know I don't. Um, however, this is at the very root of the question regarding advocacy. So when we approach this question of advocacy, the first and most important question is, what are we trying to advocate for exactly? Um, and so from a peace building perspective, there are a few considerations that I think merit further consideration. First and foremost, it's important to remember that with transitional justice, um, this needs to be a prospect for all parties involved in the conflict, at least internally in Yemen. Um, so while they vary in terms of kind of type and scale, there have been conflict related violations by all parties involved, towards all parties involved. Um, and it's the case with the Houthis, Ansarallah, with STC, with IRG, with external actors, um, everyone. In fact, much of each group's narrative is that they have suffered the injustices at the hands of the other. So it, it's just to say that it's important to avoid the notion that one group has a louder voice um, than the others as it pertains to transitional justice. Um, and, and you know, I think it's also important to think about how far do these claims go back? Um, you know, are we talking about the past seven, eight years? No, actually um, many claims on all sides go back uh, 60 years at least, you know, and, I, and I'll, be, I'll be curious to see what the colleagues um, have to add on that. But these are ingrained grievances um, and important to the parties in, in the conflict on each side. So by presenting the transitional justice process as something that should be available to everyone, to all of the parties involved, it's important, it's, it's paramount, it's crucial to obtain buy-in, in obtaining buy-in, uh, by making it an available, available thing as opposed to saying, no, this is just for this group or it's just for that group, but rather to everyone. You know, that's a, that's a bit of leverage. Okay. The second thing is, I think when we're talking about transitional justice, um, it's possible to find ways to integrate transitional justice throughout the different phases of the peace process. So again, if we know that a phase one conditional mandate for transitional justice is not a, uh, a yesable proposition at the outset, then it would be important to look for ways to integrate transitional justice into the peace process at different stages um, as a layered approach. Um, and so to be clear here, this is not a suggestion that we should dilute the transitional justice process, limit uh, to, to reconciliation or avoid or diminish accountability for human rights abuses, no. But rather to think about ways to include these mechanisms throughout the different stages of the process if they're not available or if they're not you know, possible at the forefront of the negotiation process. Where else can we include them? You know, it, we're not talking about a now or never, but they can be integrated and layered throughout, potentially, if done properly. Okay, um, just maybe one more point here. On that note, I think it's also important to really examine the structural issues related to human rights abuses as well. So when we're dealing with historical grievances as the case here, um, there's a need to take communities through a healing process to address those historical traumas that they may have experienced. Um, and so I think it's important to, to think about not just in terms of accountability per se, although it's extremely important, but rather to, in, to include community-based processes that, um, that communities need to go through to establish a solid actual peace. Um, okay, lastly, I think, you know, we, we think of structural issues related to human rights abuses, and this may be going a little bit off topic, so I'll, I'll try and keep it short, but, um, you know, we think of structural issues related to human rights abuses and the transformative nature of accountability. It's important to not only think of the politically motivated or the high level cases of abuse, but to think about the systematic and structural human rights violations that are taking place. Um, you know, what are the structural issues that allow human rights abuses to take place? Well, in Yemen, you know, there, there, there are certain mechanisms or frameworks for protection against human rights abuses that exist. So, uh, you know, my colleagues here mentioned it earlier, but the tribal dimension. So if there's an arbitrary arrest by authorities, um, often the tribes, or tribal system will intervene to get that person out. Um, or if there's a human rights abuse that takes place, 
um, you know, well, I, sh I should say that for the marginalized segments of the population, this is not the case. There's not an intervention. They're not, they're outside of the tribal framework. And so they're more marginalized, more at risk. Um, and so if a human rights uh, abuse takes place um, for a marginalized segment of the population, there's less pressure to find the resolution. And the worst part is that there's almost a social expectation that this is going to be the case. Uh, I can give an example from our work in Yemen. Um, this is somewhat linked, but you know, discrimination in schools. So we were doing some work on discrimination in schools. And we found that the Muat Machine, the darker skinned ethnic group um, community, the students were standing at the back of the classroom. And actually we went and brought desks so that they could sit down. And it didn't even cross their mind that they should, even now that there are desks, there's a space now, they should come and sit down. Um, and this is just an example of stigma that extends to society. It doesn't enter into some segments of the population that they have the same rights as everybody else, or if they're abused, that they have the same right to justice as everyone else. And so while accountability is extremely important, while uh, integrating it into the peace process is also important, looking at these structural frameworks um, that allow for abuse to take place in the first place uh, with impunity um, is, is, is really quite important to, to, to include as well. Um, and so I, I kind of want to, to just add that on. So in, in summary, what I can say is that if we're, you know, in considering transitional justice um, in light of the peace negotiations, well, presenting transitional justice as an option available to everyone is very important to not exclude people from that process, finding ways to include uh, transitional justice throughout the peace process and the subsequent uh, negotiations, not just at the forefront. And then also advocating for including, uh, you know, community-based healing, community-based processes to deal with the historical trauma um, that, that communities experienced. And to also think about and advocate for the structural issues that allow for human rights abuses to take place. I may have gone over time. I'm going to stop no, right okay. there. Yeah, thank no, you. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very insightful response. And I think before uh, the open up uh, for questions and discussion from the audience, uh, from my, from my perspective, it would be interesting to hear from uh, Tafik and his experience again with, through the through the Yemeni civil society approach through the uh, through that lens. Uh, do you think this is like this notion of kind of layered approach of integrating trans transitional justice throughout the entire peace process, not just up front? Uh, is this something that the uh, civil society in Yemen could stand behind and uh, play meaningful role, meaningful role in, uh, in, in these types of processes, uh, layered, layered integration strategy? Oh, إعادة النظر في آليات التحقيق الموجودة على الأراضي اليمنية كان القرار الصادر من مجلس حقوق الإنسان بتنحية أو بتجميد عمل فريق الخبراء خطأ استراتيجي برغم أنه الآن خضعت للقضايا السياسية اليوم لا يوجد للأسف الشديد آلية محايدة يمكن البناء عليها أنا باعتقادي تقارير 17, 16, 18 الصادر من فريق الخبراء يشكل أرضية مهمة جداً وربما حدث الحشد داخل مجلس حقوق الإنسان عندما أصر فريق الخبراء على إحالة الملف اليمني إلى مجلس الأمن وحيل الجمعية العامة على الأقل من باب امتصاص الغضب في ذلك الكلام لكن في النهاية أنهي تماما عمل هذا الفريق اليوم الخطوة الأولى على المجتمع الدولي إعادة النظر في إيجاد آلية تحقيق محايدة داخل اليمن هذا واحد الناحية الثانية يجب اليوم أن, أن يعمل المجتمع الدولي مع الشركاء المحليين حول تعزيز وبناء منظومة العدالة الانتقالية من خلال منظمات المجتمع المدني لأنه لدينا تجربة بعد ثورة الربيع اليمني في فبراير عام 2012 فشلت الأحزاب السياسية والأطراف السياسية على الأقل في إيجاد دستور متعلق بالعدالة الانتقالية في ذلك الوقت واختلفوا حول الفترة الانتقالية هل تمتد من 62 هل من 79 هل من 86 وإلى اليوم في ضحايا نزاع 86 في الجنوب وضحايا نزاع 79 في الشمال وقبلها أو, أو ما قبلها اليوم يجب أن تتعزز فكرة العدالة الانتقالية داخل المجتمع اليمني بحيث نخرج أنا أسميها بين قوسين إيجاد صيغة لعدالة انتقالية يمنية في موروث يمني يمكن أن يعزز مفهوم العدالة الانتقالية القائم على التصالح والمسامحة والانتقال إلى ما هو 
الى مرحله مقابله لكن يجب ان يبنى كل متطلبات هذه المرحله صندوق قبر الضرر يكون واضح في هذا الامر اليه المساءله والمسامحه اليه الحديث او الاعتراف بالخطا الى غير ذلك هذا ممكن خاصة إذا أعدنا ترتيب المجتمع المدني بصورة دقيقة وقوية وبالتالي هذه مهمة المجتمع الدولي لأن متطلباتها لا يمكن أن تكون محلية لنكون واضحين في هذا الجانب إذا كان المجتمع الدولي جاد في هذا الجانب أنا باعتقاد النقطة الأولى آلية تحقيق دولية محايدة ولأن آلية التحقيق بالنسبة لمنتهيكي حقوق الإنسان مرعبة أكثر من التقارير التي تصدر من المنظمات المحلية ونكون واضحين ولنرى حتى الليستة السوداء التي تصدر بين الفين والأخرى يجددها مجلس العام بمرتهكي حقوق الإنسان في اليمن يمكن بعد ذلك نبحث عن عوائق الدول التي الخارجية التي ارتكبت انتهاكات آلية معالجتها إلى غير ذلك لكن هذه الخطوتين في غاية الأهمية اليوم بناء مجتمع المدني بالشراكة في هذه الصيغة والنقطة الثانية إيجاد آلية تحقيق مستقلة دولية مستقلة في هذا Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, then, uh, if you have something to add, uh, no, I think those were both comprehensive think, answers. Yeah, we can we can go into the uh, questions. From, yeah, let's jump in from the audience. So maybe let's take uh, three questions and then uh, see how much time we have for it. Thank you very much for um, your deep insights on, on uh, human rights and other abuses. But I do see some gaps between the violations of human rights and based on what I learned or heard from Taufiq, that um, not only torture, but also actually uh, killing victims. So these are criminal acts, but transitional justice does not address criminal acts. So don't you see the gap between bringing all communities together and building societies and uh, opportunities for peace building on transitional justice, but then you have a criminal act. So does that also imply some impunity for those who are involved in, in these crimes? So thank you. Yeah. One more. I'm uh, Peter Humphrey, an intelligence analyst and a former diplomat. I'm wondering if there's any room for an Afghan style uh, lawyer jerga uh, involving all parties outside of the Houthi uh, to move the national reconciliation process along, recognizing that the Houthi uh, would only be disruptive to such a lawyer jerga. Anything else for now? Okay, I think. Uh, uh... Who uh, who would like to go to go first and tackle tackle the questions? Um, I can start the first one and then you go. Yeah. So I mean, I think it's a very important point that you raised, and I there's a distinction to be made here. Um, there are different needs um, and and priorities. So there are criminal acts. Many of I mean, most of this is is talking about um, human rights violations that are people are criminally accountable. And there's a space for that for you know for those trans uh, for those um, processes, but I think the question is uh, at what at what point what stage of the negotiation process do we want to focus on that? Um, that that for me is the is the first part. The second part is that there are also other trans uh, transitional justice mechanisms that are appropriate for uh, for other violations and maybe when we're looking at the community level, the, you know, as the community, what they have suffered. So my, my, my thinking here is that there's different tools that are appropriate for different situations or different violations. Um, and I think my colleague here might have more to, to say on that. نحن اليوم في كثير من الأحيان لا ندرك من المنتهك حقوق الإنسان أو كان المشرفين في هذا الجانب وبالتالي سيدخل ضمن هذه الآلية بمعنى أنه يجب أن تشكل لجان في هذا الجانب وأنا كما قلت يجب أن تكون هناك قوائم سوداء واضحة بمنتهك حقوق الإنسان يتم استبعادهم من أي عملية سياسية بمعنى أنه الذهاب إلى أي عدالة انتقالية لا يعني التنازل في النهاية 
النماذج التجارب العداله الانتقاليه تترك للضحايا حريه القبول بعداله تصالحيه على سبيل المثال مع جبر الضرر او الذهاب الى العداله الجنائيه سواء على المستوى المحلي او على المستوى الجنائي فبالتالي الامر انا باعتقادي لا يوجد فيه تناقض كبير لكن اذا اتفقنا من حيث المبدا على تشكيل لجان تحقيق في هذا الجانب واحنا اكدنا على وجود اليه تحقيق مستقله على الاقل يمكن البناء على مخرجات Yeah. And I'd just like to add one point as well. It doesn't, um, it, you know, it's a very good question. And obviously they're, you know, they're not, um, they're, no, they're not going to be perfect solutions or even ideal solutions when it comes to justice and accountability in Yemen. If you just look at the composition of the presidential council that was formed and, you know, who's on it and such, um, you know, but one, one potential avenue to are reparations. And I know it's sort of a hot topic right now. Um, and it doesn't, you know, it does not deliver accountability in the, or, or justice in the sense of bringing perpetrators to account, but various conflict parties have indicated their willingness to pay out reparations, you know, including the, uh, including the, the Saudi-led coalition and including the Houthis, you know, and, and so the trouble then becomes making sure that money is not directed to, you know, um, war profiteers and, and people in control who are pulling the purse strings, but that is another avenue that at least in theory, the conflict parties have indicated their willingness to, to pay out reparations in certain cases, so. And, um, uh, السؤال اللي ذكره الاخ ما كان واضح في الترجمه لو يعيد السؤال. Sir, if you can repeat uh, the, the question about the national national reconciliation process. A lawyer, Jerica, is the Afghan tradition of bringing all the tribal leaders together, literally under one tent, and hashing over issues which they've disagreed with. Uh, since forever. And this is the reconciliation process that advanced in Afghanistan prior to the Taliban takeover, recognizing that the Houthi would act as the Taliban did. We have to leave them outside the tent and ask whether all the tribal parties could come together and discuss the reconciliation process within Yemen. بالنسبة للمصالحة الداخلية بمعنى أنه كل طرف يتصالح مع القبائل الموجودة تحت ولايته وسلطته هذا أمر ممكن واليوم تدار هذه العملية من خلال سواء الأطراف في الداخل باسم المصالحة الوطنية لدى الحكومة الشرعية أو المصالحة التي تقوم بها قادة جماعة الحوثي وينتقلون من محافظة إلى أخرى لكن الإشكالية اليوم في الأطراف الفاعلة والرئيسية وهي أطراف لا تمتلك قرارها للأسف الشديد اليوم نعول على حل الموضوع اليمني بالتقارب السعودي الإيراني وبالتالي اليوم اليمنيون لا يمتلكون هذا القرار السؤال الأكبر هل الأطراف الإقليمية جادة في إنهاء هذه الحرب اليمنية أم لا هذا السؤال بحاجة إلى يعني تحليل أكبر بحيث يمكن أن نصل إلى إجابة دقيقة وافية هل المستقبل على المستوى القريب والبعيد والحوارات الدائرة اليوم بالفعل هل هي بعيدة عن التأثير الإقليمي ولا لا فبالتالي الوضع يعني غير واضح حتى الآن لأنه في النهاية لا يوجد طرف يمني يمتلك قرار الحرب وقرار السلم قرار الحرب وقرار السلم في اليمن هو قرار إقليمي Um, hello, uh, my question is to Taufiq. So uh, regarding uh, Yemeni organization's effort, uh, does it stop uh, or end by, uh, by uh, documenting the violation of human rights and uh, issuing reports or does it move to the uh, next level, which uh, international level, uh, uh, bringing the uh, names of the violators to international court or to the UN sanctions? And if not, why do you think from your perspective? Thank you. Taban. <laughs> كنماذج لمنظمة سامد الأمر لا ينتهي عند عملية رز وتوثيق يتم رفع هذا التقارير مراسلة المنظمات المجتمع المدني التواصل مع لجان التحقيق 
الخاصه باليمن سواء اللجان المعنيه بالشان اليمني التابع لمجلس حقوق عفوا المجلس الامن او الفريق الفريق السابق الذي تم تجميده التابع لمجلس حقوق الانسان او حتى لوزاره الخارجيه الدول مثل الامريكيه وغيرها في هذا ربما الامر الجانب الجنائي في اشكاليه ولا اليمن غير موقع على اتفاقيه روما ولا يوجد دوله يمكن ان تتبرع الاردن مثلا في التحالف موقع على اتفاقيه روما لكن هناك تواصل مع بعض المنظمات في الدول التي لقضائها صلاحيه القضاء الشامل مثل فرنسا على سبيل المثال في قضايا التعذيب رفعت بعض ضد بعض القاده الذين ارتكبوا جرائم تعذيب داخل اليمن في اشكاليه مع جماعه الحوثي لانه بالنهايه ما ليس الدوله لا احد يعترف بها حتى نواجه اشكاليه في التعامل معهم من خلال المقررين الخواص لانهم يتعاملوا بدرجه اساسيه مع مع الدول بدرجه كبيره فالمنظمة تبذل جهدها لكن إذا نلاحظ مع النظر بعين الاعتبار لوضع المنظمات هيكلتها رؤيتها تمويلها إلى غير ذلك لا تجمع بالنسبة للمنظمات هي قانونية ولوجستية Okay. Thank you, thank you very much. I know uh, we probably just like barely managed to scratch the surface of uh, of the discussion on these very important issues. We could probably spend several days in this room talking uh, talking about uh, the needs for transitional justice, for uh, for reporting on human rights violations in Yemen. But uh, unfortunately, I think we're out of time for today. So hopefully, these uh, conversations can continue. Uh, and I would like to thank uh, the, the Middle East Institute for, uh, for co-hosting this wonderful event with us. Thank you, and, and please uh, join us in thanking the panel. Uh, I want to thank all of you for, uh, for coming and, and sharing this, uh, these few hours with us. Uh, I think what we wanted to do was to try to begin to touch on many of these issues that are going to be critical um, as as we move forward, uh, we hope that uh, that uh, Tim Lender King is correct and that we are uh, seeing uh, progress towards an end uh, of the uh, of the civil conflict in Yemen. Uh, but important for all of us to understand uh, that we are just beginning uh, to engage in some of these issues, human rights and social justice. Uh, climate, environment, uh, economics, and politics that are going to shape the future of Yemen and that are going to be uh, with us and with the Yemeni people for many years to come. So thank you uh, all, and we hope to see you next time. Thank you.